Hi everyone, my name is Siddharth Bhatia and welcome to my talk on building an immediate mode graphical user interface from scratch. The supplementary material for this talk is present in the first link and the second link is linked to a package called simpleimgui.jl which is a small package that I've developed to create imguis in Julia. Here is an example of a basic graphical user interface. So you can move around with the mouse, you can click on buttons, you can move the slider, you can enter text in this text box and so on. So these things like button, slider and text boxes, they are called widgets and you can interact with these widgets using some input device like a mouse or a keyboard. This interaction happens in a loop. So the user will provide some user input like when they press a mouse button and the application will receive this input and provide some feedback like it will update the screen for example in response to the input. Broadly there are two paradigms of interfacing with the UI library and they are retained mode and immediate mode. In order to explain what these paradigms are and how they differ I would like to point you to other resources that have explored these concepts in much more detail. In this talk what I will talk about is one possible implementation of an immediate mode graphical user interface. And what I present is definitely not the only way to do it. So I highly recommend you check out those other resources. Here is a partial pseudocode of our graphical user interface application. So we will start by creating a window using the help of a windowing library in in this case, I'm using glfw, which also has a Julia wrapper package called glfw.gl. Next, we will instantiate an object of type user input state to keep track of the user input in a frame. So for example, if some buttons were pressed or like the mouse was moved, so these things can be tracked in this struct. Next, we will instantiate an object of type user interaction state. So one insight to note in graphical user interfaces is that the user can only be interacting with one widget at a time. So for example, if you have a button and if you have a slider and if you are interacting with the slider, then at the same time, you cannot be interacting with the button. So to keep track of which widgets the user is interacting with, we use this struct. Next, we will define a callback function. So this is an example of a mouse button callback. So this function will be called when a mouse button is pressed or released. After that starts our main update loop, which will go on as long as the window is open. And in each iteration of this loop, we will process the widget interaction based on the user input and draw things on the screen and so on. In the end, we will ask glfw to poll the events that happened during uh, when this iteration was being executed. So this will update our user input state using the callbacks that we registered earlier. Finally, once we are done with this loop, in the end, we will destroy the window and close our application. Now let's look at the user input state type to keep track of user input per frame. Let us start by looking at the behavior of a very simple input device, which is a mouse button. So on the horizontal axis, we have time and on the vertical axis, we have the state of the mouse button. So the mouse button could either be pressed or not pressed. And as the user presses and releases the mouse button, we'll get some sort of signal over time. Now we need to convert this continuous analog signal into a discrete digital domain so that our computers can actually do something with it. So for that, we will sample the signal at some regular intervals and we'll obtain a set of values at those, at those instants. So in this case, to represent the mouse button state, we just need one bit because it, it, it just takes two values. So we can represent it with one bit. And so after sampling, we'll obtain a sequence of bits 
here for example 1 represents that the mouse was pressed and 0 means the mouse was not pressed okay now let's say we are running at 60 frames a second so 60 times a second we iterate over our main loop and let's say in this graph this is what 1 60th of a second corresponds to. So this is basically duration of one frame. And we want to capture the user input in this frame for this mouse button. So let's ignore everything that's outside this range. And in this range, what we will keep track of is whether the mouse ended down at the end of the frame and how many transitions did it go through during the frame. So these two things are enough for us to keep track of the events that happened with this mouse button. Using just these two numbers does not capture the time information about the transitions, like when those transitions occurred within a frame. But that is okay because in practice, within 1 60th of a second, it's anyways hard to for the user to perceive accurate times as to when these mouse transitions occur. And it's unlikely that multiple transitions will occur in one sixty second anyways. So this is okay if we just record this information. So with this in mind, we define a struct called input button, which has two attributes, ended down and number of transitions. And with this information, we can, we can find out if the mouse went down within a frame or not. So went down would just mean that if it went from unpressed to pressed state inside the frame. So if the number of transitions is two or more, then definitely it took a round trip. And so it, it went down at least once within that frame. Otherwise, if there was just one transition and if the mouse ended down, that means it would have gone from up to down so that's unpressed to pressed and so that's also an indication that the mouse went down and so on so we can find out with if, if the mouse went up or not in a in a, within a frame okay so we know how to now represent the input captured by these switch like devices so for example mouse buttons or even keyboard keys can be represented this way now let's look at our user input state type and see what all information it contains. So let's say we have for the cursor, we can track the position of the cursor in screen coordinates and for different buttons, for left button, right button of the mouse and for different keys, we can have all these different attributes. Now this is just one way to represent it. You can have others as well. Let us now look at user interaction state which basically is used to keep track of which widgets the user is interacting with and so on. So in our pseudocode, we have this user interaction state and in our loop, basically the widget related code is something like this. So we have, let's say a button and I'm calling it button one. So first we'll create an ID for this button to uniquely identify this button. So this ID needs to be the same for this button across different frames. We'll see how to get this ID, how to generate this ID. Okay. Then we get the value for this button uh, by doing a function call to do widget bang function. And it'll take a bunch of uh, arguments like the type of this widget, which is button take the user interaction state, user input state, its ID and so on. So other things like where to place a button, things like that. After getting value, we can just check if that value is true. So if uh, button one value, then we can do whatever we wanted to do with this widget when this widget got triggered, right? And finally, we'll also draw this button because we want it to be displayed. Now I sort of put these as separate steps, but uh, like some of them can be combined like button one ID. We need not store it in a variable if we don't need it. And similarly drawing of a button, it can be done inside the do widget function. 
there are several ways to generate a widget id and what we'll be looking at is widget ids that sort of relate to the position of a widget in the code so to speak we can start with a simple widget id that tracks the line number where the widget was defined in its source code file so you can use the add double underscore line double underscore macro to get the line number in that source code file but what if we have two widgets defined in two separate files but on the same line number in this case we'll get the same id for these two widgets and the id will not be unique to counter this we can add the file name as well inside our widget id so we can use the add double underscore file double underscore macro to get the path to the file and now line 102 in file1.jl is different from line 102 in file2.jl and so we get unique ids for our widgets let's look at another sort of corner case what do you want to create widgets in a looping fashion so in this code we are creating a button five times and these are five different buttons but if we just use the file name and line number then all these buttons will get the same id even though they are different buttons so to tackle this we can add one more attribute called instance this will be the instance number of that widget so if we are creating widgets in a loop then we can have different instance numbers assigned to them so this i will take values from 1 to 5 and thus all these buttons will have different buttons will have different ids corresponding to them okay so in our pseudo code we'll complete this button one id using the widget id finally we'll look at the user interaction state and that is a struct that contains three attributes so it keeps track of the hot widget the active widget and the null widget the hot widget is the widget that is about to be interacted with active widget is the widget that is actually being interacted with and null widget is just a null widget so when no other widget is hot and active null widget is the one that is uh, whose values used and null widget id is this constant uh, which basically cannot correspond to an actual widget so yeah okay now we know what hot and active widgets are right so hot widget is the widget that is about to be interacted with and active widget is the widget that is actually being interacted with so there are a few rules for hot and active widgets and they are as follows firstly only one widget can be hot at a time only one widget can be active at a time and except the null widget all the other widgets if they want to be active then they must have been hot before that so they must be hot before they can become active so let's say we have three button widgets button one button two button three and the null widget of course initially when we start off it is the null widget that is hot and active now let's say in a frame the user moved the mouse over the first button widget when that happens our button one will become hot and null widget will not be hot anymore now in order to do this transition or check for this transition we'll use this method called try set hot widget which will try to set this widget in this case button one to hot so this happens inside the do widget function call for this widget button one so this function is going to return us the new hot widget so either that could be this widget which is button one in this example or the widget that was hot before that now button one will become hot if and only if the null widget is hot the null widget is active and some trigger condition occurs so in our case that condition is that the mouse went over the button on the screen 
If that did not happen, then whichever widget was hot previously will stay hot. Okay, once our button one has become hot, if the mouse is still over the button and the user clicks the mouse, like the mouse button goes down, then our button one widget will become active. And to try to set the button one as active, we use this function called try set active widget, which again will be based on some conditions. So first of all, our button one should be hot and null widget should be the one that is active. And when this trigger condition happens, that mouse was over button and mouse went down, then this widget will become active, which is button one. Otherwise, whoever was active previously will stay active. Okay, let's say we are now in a state where our button one is hot and active and the user released the mouse button. So the mouse went up in a frame. Now our button one will stop being active. First of all, for this transition to occur, our button one should be hot and active and the trigger condition is that the mouse went up. So when that happens, the null widget becomes active and button one is not active anymore. Finally, if you are in a state where button one is hot but not active and the mouse is not over the button anymore, then button one will stop being hot and null widget will become hot again. And to reset this hot widget to null widget, we'll use this try reset hot widget function. And depending upon some condition, either the null widget will be the next hot widget or button one will keep being hot. This is the interaction cycle for a widget. And whenever a widget needs control, it will first take it from the null widget and eventually must return control back to the null widget for other widgets to take up control. Okay, so we have seen how control gets transferred from one widget to another. Now let us look at the value that is returned by the do widget function. For a button widget, the value that is returned is a boolean, which indicates whether the button was clicked or not. So for the button widget to return a value of true, first of all, it must be hot and active. And we can define a behavior such that we call it a button click when the mouse was over the button and the mouse was released when it was over the button. Otherwise, we can return false. Similarly, other types of widgets can return values in other ways. For example, for a slider widget, the value that is returned may be a number that gives the value of the slider and for a text box widget, the value that may be returned could be the text in the text box. Let us finally look at the do widget function for our button widget. This is a lower level method which takes in a bunch of arguments that are not bundled together. It takes the widget type, which is button, Along with that, it will take the widget IDs corresponding to the hot widget, active widget, null widget, and this widget. That this widget is, is the one for which we are calling this two widget function. We will start off with calculating the values of certain relevant predicates, like whether the mouse was over the widget in this frame. We can get this by checking if the coordinates of the mouse lie within the bounding box where the widget is supposed to be placed on the screen. Next, we can keep track of whether the mouse went down in this frame and whether the mouse went up in this frame. Then we can go through the interaction cycle for this widget. So starting by trying to set 
that widget as the hot widget and then trying to set that widget as the active widget and at this point trying to get the value for the widget and after that trying to reset the active widget to the null widget and finally trying to reset the hot widget to the null widget and we will return the IDs corresponding to the hot widget, active widget, null widget and lastly we'll return the value of this widget itself. Note that not all of these transitions may occur within a single frame. For example, trying to set the button widget as hot in the beginning and then trying to reset the hot widget to null widget in the end require contradictory conditions and so they may not occur within a single frame. Another caveat is that as I mentioned earlier, we are not keeping track of the timing information or the order in which these events occur within a frame. So we might run into some corner cases when multiple events happen in a frame. But in practice, it is unlikely to happen that the user is able to accurately perceive the correct timing and order information of events within a frame especially when we are running at a fairly high frame rate like 60 frames a second so i will just hand wave it away this was the two widget method for the button widget type now let's look at the do widget method for another widget type which is slider so this is very much similar to that of button. The only difference is in how we get the value of this widget. And for that, we will also need to have the last value of this slider. So if the slider value was not changed by the user interaction, then we need to return the last value. That's why we need that. But otherwise it is very much similar to the button widget. We can also take a look at the two widget method for the text box. Note that in this case, the function is do widget bang because it actually modifies one of the arguments and that is the text argument, which is typically a vector of characters. Note that in the case of text box, the conditions that trigger the transitions of hot and active widgets are different than those for a button or a slider. Another difference is in how we get the value for the text box. Okay, so that's pretty much it. And now you have the tools to create your own custom widgets as well based on the primitives that I've explained here. There are a few things that we haven't discussed like automatic layouting of widgets on the screen and a few other nuances. But other than that, I think we have covered most of the important concepts that enable us to build an immediate mode graphical user interface from scratch. I hope you found this useful and interesting enough to give it a shot. Feel free to share your feedback or ask any questions by raising an issue on the repository for this talk. Thank you for listening and have a nice JuliaCon.